Greetings, I'm Andy Johnston, Minnesota State University. This is a pre-recording of a Zoominar that we're going to have on Thursday, September 29th at 6 o'clock p.m. So welcome to this. This is a kind of new thing for us. So in this Zoominar, and a Zoominar is like a webinar, except there's chances to interact with me and to work in breakout rooms. So get ready to learn some new things, some word recognition strategies, interact with other teachers, and you'll be able to interact with me as well. So this is an overview of our session. We're going to try to have at least two breakout sessions, essential terms, and you see it right there. So the question is, how can we improve students' ability to recognize and identify words while reading. And the goal is for you to understand some of the essential processes related to creating meaning with print, reading, and skills, to learn some new strategies, to take them with you so you can use them tomorrow, and most importantly, to meet and talk with other teachers. That's our goal. But in all things, keep it as simple as possible. There's no super secret special strategies that you need to be specially trained in. There is no best program or best method or approach. There are only best teachers, and good teachers have a toolbox filled with teaching strategies. This will be what you'll be doing in the breakout session. So part one, understanding the basic process of creating meaning with print. This is key to designing effective instruction and interactions for reading. Know that reading is not sounding out words. This is the simple view of reading. That reading simply goes from the page up to your thalamus. You understand it, you process it, and then it goes up to the cortex. This one-way process this is an outdated view of reading. This is the simple view of reading. Reading is not sounding out words. It's creating meaning. Without meaning, you are not reading. Reading is creating meaning. Our brain naturally is a meaning-making organism. We naturally try to create meaning around us. Now, during the process of reading, more nerve fibers go from the cortex down to the thalamus than from the thalamus up. Almost 10 times more. Now, in the simple view of reading, you gather information from the page, words on the page, went up to the eyes to the thalamus, and then up to the cortex. But in actuality, more information is flowing down from the cortex to the page, then the page up. What does that mean? We use what's in our head to make sense, to create meaning with what's on the page. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. But this is called the neurocognitive or the psycholinguistic view of reading. We see the input on the page. That's the data. Goes to the relay station, and then we use three cueing systems to recognize the words, phonological, syntactic, and semantic. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Information then goes up to the cortex. And as we said, there's almost 10 times more information flowing from the cortex down than from the thalamus up. Neurocognitive brain imaging research has showing that, showing that there's almost a 10 times more uh, there's almost 10 times more information flowing down than flowing up. Our brain uses three cueing systems to recognize words. You see the word and you recognize you know what it is automatically. And these systems work automatically. Yes, we use letters and letter patterns to recognize words, but we also use semantics or context and syntax, grammar or word order, language structure, all these work together to enable us to recognize words quickly and effortlessly during the act of creating meaning with print, which is reading. 
Now, an overemphasis on phonics can impede students' progress. That means you're focusing on this one and you're atrophying the other two cueing systems. Now, this does not mean that phonics should not be taught. It means that you need to include all three in developing students' ability to recognize words. So five things to know about reading. First, during reading, your brain actually uses as few letter clues as possible to recognize words. We're using our schema or the information in our head. A schema is like a file folder containing information around basic topics. The more information we have, the better able we are to read and understand. For example, I can read things about literacy pretty quickly and understand them pretty effortlessly because there's a lot of schema in my head, a lot of file folders related to literacy instruction. The same brain trying to understand things about financial planning, not so much. File folders, very empty. We use what's in our head to help us recognize words and understand context in print. Now, we spend a lot of time on diphthongs and triographs and vowels, but actually, they're not very important at all. For example, all the vowels have been removed in the next section except for the initial vowels. And most of us can still read it. Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince. He lived in a castle. One day, an evil wizard came and trend him, turned him into a frog. The prince cried out, help me. You get the idea. We can read this with all the vowels except the initial ones removed. Still don't believe me? All right, oh, that's just fine. This is a passage about a black bear in the woods. All the, all the consonants have been removed and just the vowels are here. Can anyone read that with just the vowels and no consonants? Those very very important vowels. No? Okay. What about now? Most of you can get a sense. These are just the consonants. So how important are those vowels that we get all worked up about? Number three. That doesn't mean we shouldn't teach vowel sounds, but let's get a little perspective here. Our eyes do not move in an orderly line from left to right when we read. They make jump, jumps and skips. The jumps are called saccades. We go back, which is called regressions. The place where we stop on a word, that's called the fixation. And we can only perceive those things we fixate on. And we can perceive what's called the fovio, which is the size of a grape at arm's length. That's all that is really clear. We only fixate on that. Proficient readers only fixate on approximately 60% of the words. And of those words, we tend to land on the middle. Now remember, we can only see clearly, I would say three to six words. How is it possible that we read more than 10 words a minute? We're using our brain to fill in the blanks. Our brain tricks us into thinking that we fixate on every word and that we read in a straight line. Next time you're reading some text, try to keep track of where your eyeballs are moving. They don't go like this. They go like this. An inefficient reader, by the way, reads like this, very letter by letter. And get used to watching the eyeballs of your readers. An efficient reader reads a little more smoother, and you can see the eyeballs darting back and forth. Proficient readers often insert words that are semantically or syntactically correct. Semantically means they make sense within the sentence and meaning is retained. How is that possible? If they are still going word by word, they are understanding at a deep level, and they are inserting words that still make sense. As well, they often uh, put in words or, or insert words that 
make sense grammatically. Meaning is not retained, but it makes sense grammatically. Just These are just some of the clues that tell us we use more than letter sounds, more than phonics, to recognize words. We also use syntax and semantics. So, pedagogical strategy number one. Say blank. Skippy the Frog says, say blank. What you say? I say, say blank. Teach students to say blank and keep moving on. I was working with a young third grade girl. She would stop on a word and she would process every single letter to try to figure it out. Take about 10 seconds. Then she'd test it out. I told her to say blank. She'd say blank, skip over the words, and about two seconds later, she'd go back and she'd recognize that word. Now, which is more effective for creating me? Trying to put 10 letters and taking 10 seconds, skipping it, taking two seconds, and identifying the word. Of course, it's skipping it is. So teach students to say blank. It doesn't matter if they recognize every word as long as they're creating meaning with print. And we actually teach students to let their eyes go to both sides of the word to look for clues. We teach them this explicitly. Look for clues on both sides. And we use what's called a close. The elf fell and blank his head. Well, it's an action. What do you think, boys and girls? What's your guess? And we write down a couple ideas. All right, we've got another clue. What do you think the guess is? Write down another. We do these close and maze activities. It takes two to six minutes. But we're developing their ability to use semantic clues or context to recognize words during reading. Slight transition here. Five essential literacy terms. Now, the first one is word recognition. This is different from word identification. This is when you see a word on the page and you instantly know what that word is. You recognize it. This is the desired end state that you don't have to process, that you recognize most words instantly. Word recognition. This is different from word identification. That is a strategy. Word recognition is a skill, and I'll differentiate for that in just a minute. The word is in the dictionary in your head called the lexicon. You have the word there, but you don't recognize it as you're reading. You're reading, you come across that word, you stop, and you say to yourself, I don't recognize that word. I need to consciously implement a strategy. So we consciously implement one of four strategies to identify the word. We teach the strategy, the process, to develop the skill. So eventually, they do these things automatically. More on that in a later. Later, Decoding is sounding out words, using the letter code, phonics, to identify unrecognized words. And again, word identification, word recognition, and decoding. Technically, they are different. Now, a strategy is a cognitive process that has become uh, that you have to consciously apply. You consciously say, I need to use this strategy. Word identification strategies. You, rec you realize you don't recognize that word, so you consciously say, I need to use this strategy. Same with a study skill strategy. I need to use some strategy. I'm not comprehending. I need to employ a comprehension strategy. That is a strategy. A skill is a cognitive process that has become automatic. Word recognition, processes, cognitive processes related to comprehension, metacognition. These all we want to become automatic. It's called automaticity. So we teach the process to develop the skill. So students do this automatically, metacognition. They realize they don't understand and they go back and they reread metacognition. These are all skills, strategies that have become 
automatic. We teach the strategy to develop the skill. We teach these various strategies, word recognition strategies, to develop the skill. All right, slight transition here, recognizing words. We don't teach students to recognize words more as much as we develop their ability to recognize words. Remember, we want them to do this automatically. So we're developing these processes. So let's start with phonics. Now, everybody believes that phonics instruction is important in helping students recognize and identify words. Absolutely. It's not the what of phonics. It's the how. It's taught and how much of phonics that is in question, that people have different ideas. Everyone believes in phonics. It's not the what, it's the how and the how much. There are three kinds of phonics instruction, synthetic, analytic, and large unit, and we will go over each one. The first one, synthetic, synthesize, putting things together putting letter sounds together to create words. This is the traditional view of phonics that most people associate when they hear the word phonics. M, E, P. Synthesize, synthetic fibers, synthetic. Putting things together to create something new. Synthetic phonics, absolutely, we need to do this. But we also need to do analytic phonics, taking things apart or analyzing them. Analyzing words in print using language experience approach. Big books are common books. You see a word, you, see, you analyze it. What's the beginning sound? Can you find any ah, ah words? Where are the sp, sp words? You are analyzing letter sounds and patterns within words. And one common thing is to do a treasure hunt. After teaching short A and short U, have students go through a book they have already read, and either put tally marks or actually write the words that they find. That is an example of analytic phonics, analyzing words they see in print. Large unit phonics is looking for recognizable parts or letter patterns, comparing unknown words to words you know or word parts, word families, phonographs, patterns, prefixes, suffixes. More on that in a minute, but that is large unit phonics. You should use all three. What's the best approach? Well, it's the one that works, but you should include all three of these approaches to phonics. And eventually, some students need more of one thing and less of the other. Others need more of the other and less of the one. So you need to watch your students to see what they need and are responding to. Now, phonics is very important, but it is only one of the three cueing systems. We don't want to focus on this and let these two systems atrophy. So some strategies for using large unit phonics. And as you do these activities, you can reinforce letter sounds and patterns at the same time. Now, these are the 30 most common phonograms. Some people call them word families, and I like to use these for uh, large unit phonics. Phonogram inquiry, simple idea, use a book they've already read, go through it, create tally marks or write the words, finding these word families. And you can write the words or use tally marks. These make great inquiry activities for kindergarten, first, second grade, tally marks, and then create a bar graph based on that. Simple idea, large unit phonics, looking for patterns or phonograms or word families. Shared reading, Margaret Mustada. Oh, she has some great stuff. The teacher reads a book to students. Students then read the text independently or with a partner using buddy reading. Students identify interesting or important words from the selection. Now you want to get a group of 8 to 15 or 20 depending on the age of your students. So you can have each buddy pair identify, depending, you know, 3 to 5 words. You decide. They come back, the teacher records the word on the board, a poster, or a screen. For younger students, you come back the next day with 3 by 5 cards, 
younger students or a list, then students have to put these words in groups based on letter patterns. Word sort. This uh, calls, invites them to analyze the words based on letter patterns. This is a form of inductive analysis or inductive reasoning, a powerful form of learning. They can decide the letter patterns or letter groupings. And then so you can create a word wall or poster based on the title of the book. You can put the groups and the words within each group and they can see the words in context. And of course, you can use these words for spelling lists or word prompts or riddles or whatever you want. Powerful, powerful strategy. Word sorts of any kind, and we just showed you one. But here, again, you can use letter sound and meaning, meaning they can focus on patterns, letter sounds, include student-generated words or words from books students are reading, try to find them within contexts, but you can also have them sort based on meaning, groups based on meaning, and this is a way to extend vocabulary or word knowledge, word sorts. Not a, you know, this is nothing new here. I'm just probably reinforcing a lot of things many of you already know. Now, word building, const uh, constructing words based on onset and rhyme. Onset is the beginning sound, rhyme is the word family. You can do it letter phonogram or phonogram letter. Here's different letters, add a phonogram to it. You can either write or say the complete word. Here's the letter, add phonograms to. Now you can use uh, Scrabble letters or cards or you decide how to use it. But word building is any time you put letters and word groups together to create a word. They begin to recognize the letter pattern, the large unit, the phonogram, the for word family. I like to do this on a computer because you can go relatively quickly. This takes three to six minutes focusing on that word family. P plus A. Yes. D plus A. And this sort of word building takes two to four minutes at most. Word discrimination. Understand the concept, adopt and adapt. Three words that are similar, and again, you can reinforce letter patterns or word families if I'm doing short A or the app family or the at family. You either say or show a picture of the word. Students have to select the correct word, cap. So it invites them to analyze each word carefully to recognize the letter pattern or sound. Notice that each of these are the same except one has a different middle sound, one has a different ending sound. And again, it invites them to fully analyze each word. You can do this on a computer or paper or cards. They can work with a buddy, adopt and adapt this one. Two to five minutes a day, reinforcing. Word walls, another way to reinforce letter sounds or patterns. They can be uh, based on letter sounds and patterns or meaning. Letter sounds, families, yes. And you can create a lot of activities based on the word wall. Letter family, letter family. Words on the wall, you can use those for spelling, unlimited. Word wall riddle review. This is how you might use a word wall to reinforce a letter sound or pattern. Not happy. Which one of these means the same as not happy? And this is a quick Five minute sponge activity. You can do this with very words. They have to, again, review the list and find the one that is correct. You're reinforcing. Remember, I said we do not teach as much as develop the conditions to enable students to recognize words quickly. We want them to begin to recognize and see patterns. We don't want them to have to process each individual letter, we want them to recognize patterns. That's how the brain works most efficiently. Now, a super word riddle. Here we've worked with these different families. I have them color coded to make them very, uh, to make them stand out. And I'll say, boys and girls, I'm thinking of a word that means the same as pig meat. And they have to go through and find the word that's correct. What I like about these riddles is eventually I can ask students to create their own riddles. 
And again, this makes a great sponge activity if you have two to five minutes before recess. You need to soak up a little time. These are great ways to reinforce letter patterns at the same time. This is a powerful one. Replay analysis. Students are presented three to six sentences on a sheet of paper. Younger students start with three. And notice how I'm reinforcing the short A sound because I have short A words in each of the sentences. That's how you reinforce. Each sentence contains at least one word with a target letter sound or pattern. Students read the sentences aloud and audio record the sentences. And there's a lot of devices, iPads, that you can use to record. They then listen to their recording and underlined miscued or stumbled words. They review them, reread, and record the sentences. And they do this until fluency is achieved. So they may underline the first time, circle the second time. Usually it takes no more than two times to get all the stumble words out, and then they reread until fluency is achieved, reading it without any stumbles. And again, younger students, three, older students, four, five, or six. Replay analysis. Sentence dictation. This is done a specific way. Either a teacher or a partner reads three simple sentences to the students and they write down what you say. And again, at least one word in each sentence has the target letter sound or pattern, and you can see it here, the short A. Students write the sentence, and after each sentence, students look for words that do not look right, and they underline them. Most students can identify the word that doesn't look right. And again, we are reinforcing, helping them to look for patterns. Then you show students the complete sentence with the correct spelling, can show them a card or put it on a screen. They then cross out the word, they don't erase it, and they write the correct word on top. This enables them to see both the before and after. They skip a line and go to the next sentence. When all three are completed, they reread until fluency is achieved. Sentence dictation. S read the sentence, look for words that aren't spelled right, cross it out right above, Go to the next one, we read until fluency is achieved. Guess the secret word. And again, I like these games, letter patterns or word families, phonograms. You can give them a word box. Sometimes I give them letters. I have a secret word. They can guess a letter when they guess. It's crossed out. And I like to put these in teams. The team that can identify the word is the winner. And sometimes they have this word wall where they can actually see the words. Guess the secret word, short A, again. I can simply give them a word bank, and I won't put letters up. Notice here I've provided a little scaffolding by adding some letters, putting the letters there. Here I just gave the word bank. This would be for older students. Here is a word bank and a letter box. Long A, see how I'm reinforcing that? And inductively, they realize long A could have a, um, a consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, skip the word, or can have an AY. Inductively, could be AI. Slight transition. Big idea number 728. Don't correct students during oral reading, and this is tough to do. It robs them of the chance to develop metacognition, to stop and say, does this make sense? If you jump in all the time, allow them to keep going. If they're still creating meaning, do not correct them during oral reading. Teach them to say blank and look for clues, or say blank and keep going, or say, what word makes sense? Never say, sound it out. They know that if they could sound it out, they wouldn't stop. We don't want them to sound it out. We want them to use context or uh, uh, syntax. That's much more efficient than trying to put all the little letters in short-term memory at the same time. So maze and close activities are used to develop the semantic cueing system, the ability to use context. 
and I can reinforce by including a target word with the sentence. Now, a maze is a word with a, a sentence with a word missing. Or that's a close. Or a maze is a sentence where they choose from options. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But the big idea is these are activities that can be used to develop the semantic cueing system. You create a sentence and you want the target word to be abundantly obvious. You want to teach them to say blank, look for clues, and go to the end. Do you like to blank tag? That should be abundantly obvious. The goal is not to challenge them, but to develop the ability to naturally look on both sides. Remember, efficient and effective readers do not read letters by letter. They go like this and they skip back and forth. We want to reinforce that. This is a close. With younger readers, I often give a letter clue. With older readers, it's just the letters, the blank spaces. This is a maze with either two or three choices. Put the cans in the blank. Put the cans in the bag, and I'll show you some more of these. You can do six to 12 of these, four to eight minutes a day, quickly, 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 briskly moving from one thing to a next. Use target words and sentences from the word wall, letter patterns, topics, life events, shared reading, sentences from books, limited only by your imagination. Now, a pre-reading maze, a story preview gets students ready to read the story. You make a link between the pre-reading and the story. You create this maze that tells about the story or a post-reading close to reinforce vocabulary words or story elements or to see if students are comprehending. You can use these as pre- and post-reading activities. Remember, the goal is not to do the close and maze. It, again, is to develop the cueing system so students are doing it automatically. You're not teaching reading, you're developing your ability to read. And you can create maze to reinforce letter sounds or patterns. Teach them again to say blank and let their eyes skip to both sides of the word to look for clues. It makes a mess. I need to blank my room. Clues, mess, something they need to do to their room. Your guess. And I write them down or ask students to say, I need to clean my room. Very good. Sometimes I move quickly from one to the next, short A. I'm glad to blank you. Yes, glad to see you. Maze, Brad had a blank day at school. Brad had a bad day. Sometimes I move very quickly through these. Level two, Sally clapped her blank after the show, and I'm reinforcing the short A. Sa I should have put Sally there. Ask them to identify the short A words in each sentence. This is a maze mini story. This could be related to the story or unrelated, but you create a short story. Sally found a package. The first sentence is intact. The second one has the close. It blank by her back door. Yes. <clears throat> you see the close. Sally wondered what was inside. She blank opened it. Should she open it? She shook it gently. So they're not only using the context of the sentence, but they're using the context of the story, the paragraph, to help them identify words. This is what efficient readers do. And then the last sentence is complete. After that, they read the whole short story paragraph until fluency is achieved. That is a maze mini story. I can use maze to reinforce sight words. Doing five sight words a day, teach them, show them, Pat was in blank car. And they have to find the correct one. We do these rather quickly. Let go blank me. Yes. Notice these are two sight words there. I'm reinforcing the sight words that we covered. Simple idea. And the last one, to develop the syntactic cueing system, grammar 
and word order. And writing is the best way to do that. And you should include short writing activities, two to six minutes, in your reading instruction. We're going to look at six simple activities. And these activities, students are writing uh, to share their ideas. It develops grammar, word order, the syntactic cueing system. The language experience approach, you have an experience, students dictate to you, you write it down. I often have a minimum number of sentences, at least two or at least five. They practice reading what they have then said or written using their words, their experiences. Uh, they practice reading until fluency is achieved, and you can use analytic phonics to analyze words that are in their vocabulary and within their experiences. That is the language experience activity. With a first grade student, we always started with reading their last, we called it a story, and then we'd write their new story. And what's nice about this is you can save these stories and they can go back and see what they were doing two weeks ago. These can be done with small groups. You can write small group stories. It's called shared writing and save these stories. This is a third grade student. She wrote a little bit longer. I recorded this, we saved it, and we will go back and practice reading uh, at times. This is a good end of the week activity if you do it daily to go back and read your stuff from the week. Sentence mix up, emergent and beginning readers, or you can use it with olders, older readers. I'll show you a couple ideas. It can be done quickly on your computer. Sentence mix up are sentences that are mixed up used to develop the syntactic cueing system. With younger students, I like them working in pairs. Sentence that's mixed up, you have cards, they mix them up and they have to put them in order. Now you can save them in an envelope to reinforce story elements. So save all that story sentence mix up or to reinforce letters or letter sounds or letter patterns. Sentence strips are great. You can write them in front of the students, cut them up, then they can put them in the correct order. Sentence strips. When I do them on a computer, I have two to four sentences and they can do it quickly. This again is short A, used to reinforce that sound. This could be related to the story, but I tell students, tell me when you know what the sentence is. With younger students, notice I have the capital and the period as clues. Inductively teaches them to we, uh, capitalize the first letter in the first word of the sentence. Usually about here, students can put the sentence in the correct order. Simple, two to four minutes, doesn't take long, do it on the computer. Now this is a primary grade, a post-reading activity. This is related to the story, giraffes are tall, and again I mix them up and they had to put them in order. For this one I like to have actual cards so they can move them around. This makes a great station activity, by the way. You could have different sentences or a, a number of sentences at a table as they are going around. Older students keep it short, allow them to see the words, and they can either say it or write it. And the goal is to develop the syntactic cueing system over time, but you can also use it to reinforce letter sounds or patterns. If people accuse you of not teaching phonics, well, you can. Authentic writing experiences is where students write to describe their experience or their ideas. And we you allow them, encourage them to use temporary spelling. If you don't know how to spell it, just use a few letters to hold the ideas. These are two to six minutes where they usually draft and then share with a partner or in small group. And again, these can be used to reinforce story elements or letter sounds. You read a book about David gets in trouble and the prompt is, I really got in trouble when? Or to reinforce the short A, I was really mad at, at when? And then they write. Priming pictures. You show them a picture. 
Tell me about this picture. What do you want to say about this picture? What's going on here? And they write. Now, you can take this so many ways. You can take pictures of the community or playground or students. You can invite students to send in pictures. You could put this on a computer and they could type below it so they each have their own thing. If you want to use paper, I guess you could put the picture on a Word document and they could write below. There's so many cool things you could do with this activity. And they are describing their ideas related to the picture. Sentence combining. Students are given two or three sentences. They must combine them while retaining the initial meaning of both. Develops the syntactic cueing system, but this is one of the strongest um, strongest activities, strongest research-based activity to develop grammar. Notice I'm reinforcing the ILL phonogram here. Andy is on the carpet. Andy will spill the milk. Andy will spill the milk on the carpet. Simple. Take these from the story. Take them from real life. Use them to reinforce letter sounds or patterns. Sentence elaboration. Give them a sentence and invite them to make it more interesting and encourage bizarre, unique, creative ideas here. The goal is to develop, to begin to recognize that word order and grammar are needed to create meaning. You can use this as pre and post and to reinforce again. All right, slight transition. The best way to assess word recognition, students' ability to recognize words. It's the running record. This is a more authentic way to assess word recognition or identification, where students read real connected text and not single words in isolation. And this is how you do it. But you can identify an approximate reading grade level for word recognition. Now, oftentimes, the three deficit areas, fluency, comprehension, word identification, oftentimes comprehension and word recognition are different. So this one focuses just on their ability to recognize or identify words. And you can find the grade level, but grade levels are always very subjective because students' ability to create meaning is impacted by the vocabulary, the sentence structure, the text structure, and the schemata, the schema, what's in their head. That all uh, influences their ability to create meaning. So to be accurate with running records, you want to do more than one. And here's how you do. You have a graded passage, a passage that you can say it's at this grade level, uh, this lexile level. And students read it aloud, and you put a check mark over incorrectly organized words. We're not concerned here with the type of miscues or the speed, and we allow for self corrections. To calculate the accuracy, the percentage, number of correct, number of words correctly uh, recognized, and what is the percentage, and you can determine their reading level at a particular grade level. At grade level three, he was able to read at the independent level. At grade level four, he was able to read at the instructional level, and you never want to hit the frustration level. When I'm finding levels, I usually start low and keep moving up until I find their instructional level when they read consistently at 97% or less. I never want them reading at the frustration level. Now, you can buy expensive running record forms, or you can develop your own. It really doesn't matter. I don't like this form. I think it makes it much more complex. Here, they put a check mark over the ones correctly identified. And this actually is a type of miscue analysis. And there, it, this, is, this is way too complicated. So you use any piece of graded text or level text. You have them read. You have a copy of your own, and you simply put a check mark on the ones that are incorrectly identified or recognized. I like to use actual books because students are used to reading actual books. 
So what I do is give them an actual book and I type out the text and then I use this. They're reading it using pictures and what I teach them to use. And I'm able to put a check mark uh, over the ones that are incorrectly identified or recognized. I can use this for progress monitoring or a pre post before and after. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Now, the last thing I want to cover is word identification. There are four ways to identify words. Now, remember, you see a word, you don't recognize it, so you need to employ some sort of strategy. Here are the four strategies. And we teach the strategy to develop the skill, so these become automatic. And the first one is context clues, and you're teaching using cognitive modeling. You are modeling boys and girls. This is what I do. Step one, I look at the word. Step two, I read, reread the sentence and say blank for the word. Step three, I make a guess. Step four, see if my guess made sense. And I model this out loud using text that they can see. Morphemic analysis. Smallest unit of meaning within a word. So it usually refers to using prefixes, suffixes, and root words to identify a word they don't recognize. Morphemic analysis. Word identification strategy. Cheerful. But calling it morphemic analysis is not best, so call it prefix suffix strategy. And here are the steps. Look for prefix, suffix, or root that you recognize. Reread the sentence and make a guess. See if your guess makes sense. We teach the strategy to develop the skill. We use cognitive modeling. Analogy. Look for familiar parts. It could be a phonogram or letter pattern. Use the word parts to make a guess. Reread the sentence and see if it makes sense. I have these steps on posters of these four word identifications on the wall so they can see them, see what to do. And I'll say, boys and girls, if you see a word you don't recognize, use one of our strategies. And again, I like to focus on the most common uh, word families. And phonics, this is the least efficient. Look at the letters, put the letters together, make a guess, reread always to see if it makes sense. Okay, our next Zoominar will be on October 29th, How to Teach Writing.